What we know is that the impact of the pandemic would be catastrophic, if it is similar to what we had in 1918. In the United States, there has been an unprecedented amount of preparation so far. It, um, affects every aspect of public health. We have efforts for treatment, efforts for better prevention, clinical management, key communications, the domestic and international responses, and also efforts to try to prevent transmission within the community. The federal government has had a tremendous amount of resources that they have put into the development of the new antiviral drugs, antiviral drugs stockpiles, the development of new vaccines, and manufacturing facilities for vaccines. So, there's quite a lot that's happening in the United States. However, developing countries do not have the level of resources found in more developed countries. That's the real challenge.
What's the literal definition of risk? Business schools use risk analysis. So, what do you mean by risk, and we need a dictionary? When you look at dictionary, this is literal, literal definition of risk. What it says is, the definition for example, the possibility of injury, a dangerous element or factor, chance of, degree or possibility of such loss, and so on. So, risk has two parts, as you look at the literal definition of risk. One part is the consequence of some kind of particular danger, hazard loss. And the other is about the probability, of it, chance and consequence, okay? And then at least just as English language concerns, when you look up the word of safe and safety, which you learn as, it's a little bit of a loop, a little circular argument that free from harm or risks, secure from danger, harm or loss, the condition of being safe and so on for all. And why we take out of it. At least when we talk about safe at least in English language, we are talking absolute something is safe, or it sounds safe.
sea creatures are inspiring the latest devices that harness wave power. This one called the oyster sits on the sea floor and opens and closes as waves pass over it. Cables attach it to generators on the shore. Since November 2009, it's been powering 9,000 homes in the Orkney Islands. Another device looks like a snake. The anaconda is made from a rubber tube filled with water that floats just below the surface. When the swell hits the front of it, the tube squeezed above ripples down its slinks and power a turbine in its tail. Prototypes are currently being tested, but the full-scale version will be 2,000 meters long. This system also looks like a snake. But this one is made of steel. It floats near the surface, where waves make its joints move. This drive hydraulic system that power electrical generators, like the Anaconda. It's still being tested, results will prove that these devices are up to the job of supplying variable sources of green energy. Now many devices are simulating sea creatures. The first device simulates oysters, which float in the sea by using the energy from the wave. The second is the Anaconda device operating like snakes which create energy by spraying water in the tube. The third is also based on snakes, but made of steel, creating electrical energy that is a kind of green power.
Because of their protected status, a lot of bears have lost their fear of people. This may make them appear tame, but they're still potentially very dangerous. Bears are wild animals. One or two bear attacks occur each year in Glacier Park. The majority of attacks occur because people have surprised the bear. What should we do if we surprise a bear? You should try to avoid encounters in the first place by being alert and make noise, talk loud, holler. Bears will usually move out of the way if they hear people approaching. Some people say to carry bells or put bells on your pack. Most bells, even the so-called bear bells, are not loud enough. Calling out or clapping hands at regular intervals are better ways to make your presence known. But isn't it kind of rude to make a lot of noise in the woods? I mean, people go there for peace and quiet. In bear country, noise is good for you. Hiking quietly endangers you, the bear, and other hikers. People sometimes assume they don't have to make noise while hiking on a well-used trail. Some of the most frequently used trails in Glacier Park are surrounded by excellent bear habitat. You can't predict when and where bears might appear along a trail. That's for sure. I remember my surprise when a black bear charged me. It must have been running away from hikers who surprised it on the trail ahead of me. Don't assume a bear's hearing is any better than your own. Some trail conditions make it hard for bears to see, hear, or smell approaching hikers. You should be especially careful near streams, against the wind, or in dense vegetation. Stay with your group and, if possible, avoid hiking early in the morning, late in the day, or after dark, when bears are more likely to be active. Bears spend a lot of time eating, so avoid hiking in areas like berry patches or fields of glacier lilies. How will the bear act if we surprise it? Bears react differently to each situation. They may appear to tolerate you and then attack without warning. The most important advice I can give you is never to approach a bear intentionally. No matter whether we live in the country, the suburbs or the city, we come in contact with forests every day. A combination of trees, other plants, insects, wildlife, soil, water, air, and people is a forest. I'm a professional forester. That means I've been trained in the management of forests. Managing a forest is both a science and an art, which is why my education included courses in the biological, physical, and social sciences, as well as the humanities. Doesn't being a forester mean you always work in the woods? Foresters, of course, do work in the woods. More and more, however, they also work in laboratories, classrooms, planning agencies, corporate offices, and so forth. In fact, our professional organization, the Society of American Foresters, lists over 700 job categories. I've always been confused about the difference between a national park and a national forest. In a lot of ways, they're similar. For example, we can camp and hike in both. There is a difference between them. National parks, such as Yellowstone, are set aside and preserved in a near-natural state, mainly for the recreational enjoyment of the public. Our parks are administered by the Department of the Interior. National forests, on the other hand, are administered by the Department of Agriculture. Our forests are managed for their many benefits, including recreation, wood products, wildlife, and water. That means there's a difference between a forester and a park ranger, right? Yes, there are differences. A forester manages an area of forest for forest products, water quality, wildlife, recreation, and so on. A park ranger, on the other hand, manages an area in a national or state park, mainly for recreation. Another difference is who owns the land. A forester can work on federal, state, or private land, while a park ranger is almost always a government employee. My major is biology, but I'd like to work in the woods in the area of wildlife preservation. Would that make me a forester or a biologist? 
Some foresters are primarily biologists, but most foresters majored in forestry management. Foresters and wildlife biologists often work together as a team. Both foresters and biologists want to see that various types of habitat flourish. Deer, for example, require a different habitat than wolves, yet the forest can accommodate them both. The complex process inside a leaf takes energy from the sun and uses it to convert water and carbon dioxide into sugars. During this process, photosynthesis, plants convert light energy into chemical energy. All leaves carry out photosynthesis in basically the same way. First, the pores on the leaf's outer skin open up and take in molecules of carbon dioxide. Water absorbed by the roots is transported upward through the plant and it enters the leaf through its stem. Carbon dioxide and water, these are the raw materials for photosynthesis. Once carbon dioxide and water are present, photosynthesis can begin. The chemical reactions of photosynthesis take place in two stages, the light-dependent reactions and the light-independent reactions. When sunlight shines on a leaf during the light-dependent stage, its energy is absorbed by molecules of chlorophyll, which you all know is the pigment giving a leaf its green color. The light energy absorbed by the chlorophyll is used to split the hydrogen and oxygen in the water. Then, during the light-independent reactions, hydrogen from the water combines with carbon dioxide, and forms carbohydrates, including the sugar glucose, but also other molecules that are rich in food energy for the plant. In the process, excess oxygen is released to the outside air through the leaf's pores. Finally, the plant transports the products of photosynthesis. Microscopic veins in the leaf carry the food out through the stem and into the cells of the plant. This process continues all throughout the growing season, that is, as long as the leaves remain green. Drums can be divided according to shape. Some of the types are tubular, vessel, and frame drums. One of the most common tubular drums is the long drum. A lot of long drums are cylindrical. They have the same diameter from top to bottom, like this Polynesian drum. This drum was carved from a length of tree trunk and has a single skin head. For vessel drums, we have the kettle drum. Kettle drums have a single membrane stretched over a pot or vessel body. Vessel drums come in a variety of sizes, from the very large drums of Africa to the very compact and portable drums, like this one from Hawaii. The third type I want you to see is the frame drum. A frame drum consists of one or two membranes stretched over a simple frame, which is usually made of thin wood. Land animals move easily through air because air does not slow them down. Sea creatures, on the other hand, have to move through water, which is hundreds of times thicker than air. A sea animal has to push itself through water in order to move. Sea animals use many different ways to swim, creep, or glide through water. Fish are able to swim by bending their bodies into waves. 
They have flattened fins and tails that push against the water like oar blades, converting their body waves into forward movement. The size of a fish's tail contributes to its swimming speed. Small tail fins are found in slow swimmers like the eel. The medium-sized tail of the bass is linked with a medium to fast swimming speed. Long pointed tail lobes like those on the marlin are found only on fast. Early jazz musicians were active in many cities and towns throughout the southern United States. It was New Orleans, with its long tradition of African American music, that was the home of many fathers of jazz. After World War I, the musicians of New Orleans joined the general northward migration of African Americans. The first great national center of jazz was Chicago. From there, the music entered the mainstream and even gave its name to the decade of the 1920s. Jazz, blending African American folk roots with elements of popular music and European classical traditions, has been called America. Well, Alex, the National Association of Realtors is at least putting the champagne on ice. The industry group says the slight rise in sales for previously owned homes shows the housing market is finally stabilizing, which is the first sign of a recovery. Now, that of course is an interpretation of the numbers, Alex, and one that's coming from an organization known for being somewhat of a cheerleader for the housing market. Since its members are made up of realtors who've been losing a lot of money in the slump. Now. For a more sober view, I talked to Wellesley housing economist Carl Case, and he says the slight uptick in sales hardly offsets the fact that numbers are down 20% from the year before. In animals, a movement is coordinated by a cluster of neurons in the spinal cord called the central patterns generator CPG. This produces signals that drive muscles to contract rhythmically in a way that produces running or walking, depending on the pattern of pulses. A simple signal from the brain instructs the CPG to switch between modes such as going from a standstill to walking.
I'm a big fan of gap years. I took one myself, so I'm probably biased. I think that if you've got something you want to do in the year before you come to university, that you should do it. And a lot of students who want to study a biology degree actually want to go off and travel and perhaps work on a conservation project. And of course, that's all very good. It will contribute towards your degree and your preparation for that. And then when you come to us, you'll be ready for your studies. So if there's something you really want to do, then my advice is to go for it. An economist sees the world basically through a typical microeconomic toolkit that involves things like thinking at the margin rationality, opportunity cost, trade-offs. Economists, like any other discipline or dogma, has its own jargon and its own rules and its own way of seeing the world. So basically economics, or economists in general, tend to apply microeconomic concepts like that to explain the way humans behave and to make predictions about the future. So it's a fantastic place to be a puffin. There are no ground predators. There is protection. On the other hand, if you're going to increase in numbers, and we increased from 5 pairs then to 2,000 pairs in 1972. When I started up to about 80,000 pairs in 2003, you've got to have a lot of food. I mean you've got to have a hell of a lot of fish however small a bird that you are. And there seems to be profound changes in the North Sea where man removed all the large fish, the large cod, the haddock and those sorts of things, for human consumption. And the numbers of small fish increased and this allowed the seabirds to increase. You've got a lot of big fish that are of no use to seabirds, they're just too big. I mean puffins will only eat fish up to about 20 centimeters long. Anything bigger than that is safe from a puffin.
This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Steve Mursky. Got a minute? A direct effect on human health related to climate change is the likely increase in infectious diseases transmitted by insects or through contaminated water. In the March 25th issue of the New England Journal of Medicine, infectious disease researcher Emily Schumann points out that insects are more active at higher temperatures and broaden their range. Altered weather patterns bring drought to some areas, flooding to others, and a higher likelihood of water contamination to both. The World Health Organization predicts a 3 to 5 percent increase in the population at risk for malaria, with a temperature increase of 2 to 3 degrees Celsius, and 2 degrees is our best case scenario right now. The WHO also sees 10 percent more diarrheal diseases related to unclean water by 2030 due to climate change. Schumann urges the development of warning systems to spot disease outbreaks early, along with continued research into treatments and vaccines, which, she writes, will go a long way in preventing human suffering that could otherwise occur as a result of climate change. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. This is Scientific American 60 Second Science. I'm Katherine Harmon. Got a minute? On Election Day, where do you vote? If it's in a church, you might be inclined to vote more conservatively than if you cast your ballot at a school or government building. That's according to research published in the International Journal for the Psychology of Religion. And the effect seems to hold, whether you're Christian, Muslim, or agnostic, progressive, independent, or conservative. The study found that when random people were surveyed in front of a church, they gave more socially and politically conservative responses than people surveyed while standing in front of a government building. The shift in people's attitudes, the researchers suggest, was likely a result of visual priming, meaning that people who could see the religious building were, consciously or not, getting cues that influenced their response. The surveys were conducted in Europe, so it's possible American voters might react differently but the survey included subjects from more than 30 countries to try to minimize a particular national bias. So, before you cast your vote this election year, think about whether your view is influencing your views. Thanks for the minute. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Katherine Harmon. Although the original American Indian cultures were highly diverse, they were similar in many of their traditions. Religious beliefs and rituals permeated every aspect of Indian life. Southwest tribes such as the Hopi and the Apaches had a rich and elaborate year-round sequence of ceremonials including songs, dances, and poetry. The Hopi performed dances to bring rain. The Apaches engaged in special dances and ceremonies to gain the support of the spirits before undertaking raids or going into war. The Plains tribes often sought contact with the spirits by going on a vision quest.
I want to make an appointment with the manager. There is an accounting assignment for finance students. Restaurants are down to the hall and next to the right. The department is organizing a trip to London in July. You have to send me your essay in two courses and three modules. There were a lot of traffic jams this morning. Practical experiments are an essential part of the chemistry course. You must call your doctor to make an appointment. The large, wide table is not for sale.